Hey, uh, is this thing on? Okay. Uh, yeah, great. Hi, it's Tony Bruski from Real Ghost Stories Online. In 2019, we are going to be going on the road for select live dates. That's right. We're going to be doing Real Ghost Stories Online live and on location at select dates around the United States in 2019. If you want tickets, all you got to do is go to our website, realghoststoriesonline.com, and then click on tour dates. These are going to be intimate live shows with like 50 to 100 people only in limited capacity areas. Real one-on-one stuff where you can share your stories with us. We will discuss person to person and really have an amazing night on our select dates. To see where we're going to be and what tickets are available right now, go to realghoststoriesonline.com, click on tour dates and if you're in one of those areas or willing to travel a little bit, get some tickets and see us live in 2019 as we take Real Ghost Stories Online and the Grave Talks on the road. Check it out, realghoststoriesonline.com, click tour dates. Today on Real Ghost Stories Online, a bunk bed holds a spirit as a family sends a loved one into the afterlife. And most of the bodies were charred beyond recognition, and 12 were left unclaimed and unidentified. The spirits of a tragic train crash still haunt a woman to this day. And Carol Hughes returns from her travels overseas. We'll find out if she hooked up with the Pope. Or maybe there were some ghosts involved. All that and more today on Real Ghost Stories Online. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802. Or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown. And quite possibly, the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. Yep, 855 4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. You can also write it on the website, realghoststoriesonline.com. Email your audio file to us. Send it to Tony, T-O-N-Y, at realghoststoriesonline.com. We'd love to hear it. And, of course, if you really like the show, become an EPP, extra podcast person. You get that special EPP bonus episode. If you haven't heard those yet, Listen on Thursdays. We give you like a 10-minute preview so you can get a real good sample of what that feels like. Uh, It's a totally different feel to this show. All about storytelling. Really, really cool. You get access to all of those. Uh, Access to our regular shows weeks before they go public and a whole bunch of other stuff. You get a free e-copy of our book, which right there is a $14 value. Uh, Amazon bestseller. You get that for free when you sign up for five bucks a month. So you're already ahead immediately. Check it out at ghostpodcast.com. Tom, Carol Hughes is with us, and I've been excited about uh, the show for uh, about a week or so now since you texted me when you got back. And uh, yeah, I'm a I'm very interested in your travels and and what uh, what happened. Did you hook up with the Pope? Is the big question. I did not hook up with the Pope. Everyone is I wondering. I did go to his place. Okay, he stood I didn't you up. See him. He stood you up. Well, me and about 20,000 other people, I don't know. And 20,000, I'm lowballing it there. There was a lot of people in Rome. You didn't just, like, catch him, like, at the snack bar or something? He wasn't just over there getting some nachos? I was looking. And I'm like, certainly. He's just, like, peeking out a window or something. (laughs) How many people are here today? But nothing. Damn. Damn. All right. Well, tell tell us about the trip. Yeah, so we had a, a weird thing happen. Okay. You know how... Like, um, you know, sometimes when you have kind of an experience, it's not like, oh, and there it was just standing right there. It's more of like this weird feeling. And for me, my heart gets to racing. Mm -hmm. So we go to this church and the church was um, uh, the architect was Bernini. Bernini is a big deal. So this church is like 1600, 1650s in there, which is relatively a new church for Rome. (laughs) So we go there to check it out and um, it's gorgeous. And so we go in and it's like, that's why I love going into those churches each time you open a door and I'm not Catholic, but each time you open a door, it's like, whoa, there's this surprise behind the door and it's so amazing, but I love history. And so the whole Catholic church really fascinates me. So, so I don't read Italian, I don't speak Italian, but we're in this church and there's this sign with this really odd picture and it's some kind of a, like a room, like a burial room Mm. with this 
this saint back there and it's only two euros to get in. And I'm like, I don't know what this is all about, but we're all paying the two euros and we're going in there. So we pay our two euros and we go to this one room and we're, I'm like, that is not the room I wanted. Cause it looked like some kind of a, like a tomb, but you know, most of them, the dead person is kind of laying flat, like a relief. Okay. And they're kind of, you know, etched in stone. And this guy's kind of like sitting up on one side and I'm like, this isn't the room. Well, oh, well, at least, you know, we got to see something. We kept calling them backstage tours. So we got the backstage tour at the church. The meet and greet with the dead guy. Right. So we walk out of there and the, this guy who took our money, he kind of does this come here move and points to upstairs. We're like, a backstage tour isn't over. <laughs> so we go up the stairs and there was that room. Now this church was built on the side of another church. That was, I think, around 1100s or something like that. So they had those doors in there. So we're like, oh, wow. And then I turn around and I saw that room with that weird tomb thing with the guy kind of sitting up on his arm, just kind of lounging there. And his life size. Mm -hmm. So we walk back in there. I literally step into that room. And it was like almost like this weird electrical current thing, like my heart in one step just started racing and I'm like, whoa. And I look at my niece who's one step behind me and I look at her and her eyes are really big. And I go, do you feel that? She goes, oh my God. And I'm like, I know it. Like I can hardly breathe. So we step on into the room and then our friend Lynn and my sister, Kathy, they're still in the other room and they walk in <clears throat> Lynn walks in, nothing. Kathy walks in. She goes, oh my God. Do you guys feel that? So all three of us have this weird, like intense heart racing experience in this room. And Lynn's like, what? I don't feel anything. <laughs> she gets nothing out of the whole thing. Uh huh. So like, I kind of like, I wanted to take a picture, which I did, but my sister's like, don't go, don't go near it. Don't go near it. And I'm like, we're okay. Like, you know, he's a saint mm -hmm. and chances like a saint, like, from the 300s or something like that. So, so we walk out of the room and the feeling goes away with all three of us. So it was really weird that three or four of us, it was like we got shocked by something the second we step in the room. So then Lynn and I <clears throat> go to another church and they have another backstage tour, but it's underneath and it's Roman ruins. Now these go back to like Romans. Mm -hmm. It's like 200. And there's like 20 rooms down there. <clears throat> so we're the only two people in there. So it was creepy, but it wasn't scary. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's a difference. So I'm being creeped out a little bit. We're walking along and I stopped to read something. And Lynn just goes, oh, my God, we need to go. And I said, like to the bathroom or something. <laughs> He's like, what yeah. do you, we have to go right now. She goes, no, I'm really uncomfortable. I'm really, really uncomfortable. And she's like panicked. And I go, what are you feeling like? And she goes, like my heart's racing really bad. And I'm like, oh my God, I think you're having a paranormal experience. Uh huh. So I'm reading the, the information about the room we're in. It's in Italian and English. And it says right there that they suspect these three people are buried there. And I'm like, oh, my God, there's supposedly three people buried around here. And she goes, we got to get out of here. We got to get out of here. Are you feeling this? And I'm like, no, I got nothing. So I was like, oh, my God, you know, you've never had an experience yeah. like that. I think you just did. So we go into the next room. She's super uncomfortable. I'm totally fine, though. We go into the next room and I walk in and then, boom, it hit me like, I couldn't hardly take, take a step. Like it was almost just paralyzed me. It was like, whoa. And it was like, my heart starts racing. Like <laughs> she wears a, a Fitbit or Apple watch or yeah. something. And her heart was racing so bad that it thought she was doing like <laughs> high level aerobics. Sure. Her watch is like, yay for you. You're working out. <laughs> <laughs> That's how intense it was. And she's like, we got to go. We got to go. So, but then it's like a maze to get out of there, but I have no idea what either one of those things were, but it was intense. 
It's it's, and, it's almost like the feeling you get when you're walking backstage at a Backstreet Boys concert, right? You know, it's like all of a sudden it's like, <laughs> here you go. Oh my God, everybody Backstreet's back, all right. You start dancing a little bit, but you're in Rome and it's in a church. So it's I a did different. get to meet some of the Backstreet Boys <laughs> a year ago, and it kind of was like that. It was like, whoa, that's a Backstreet Boy. <laughs> and like my heart started racing. Yeah, you're right. And I got a picture with him. Yeah, you just you just get that feeling, and it's just it was like, oh my god, they're just bigger than anything, <laughs> larger than life. You know, that's, that's... and he's right there. <laughs> so yeah, Backstreet Boys and Saint, it's like Stanislaus Kostka or something like that. Same he's thing. a patron saint of broken bones. <laughs> yeah, I mean Howie D and all that. It's the same sort of deal. You know, they write up there. And they're kidding. Uh, wow, I mean that is you know that's just so. It, 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 people have those experiences where you you and it's exactly what you said it's not like where it like walks up to you and like oh my god it's there but when you're overwhelmed by something and it's not like you've been looking you know your whole life to go to this church and it's like it, it, it wasn't one of those moments where it's like oh my gosh I, i'm finally at this specific one because i've been studying yeah. it and reading it and it's part of my no, religion I have, and yeah. to, with all respect to saint saint stanislaus kostka or whatever his mm -hmm. name was i never even heard of him sure and I just saw the room was so creepy. I just wanted to go up there. Yeah. But I didn't have, like, it wasn't like when I went up there, it wasn't like, oh, my God, I'm so scared. It wasn't like that at all. And we went to a lot of places in Rome. And even the, you know how I am with hotels. We yeah. had the Airbnb. It was like the building was, like, probably from the 1800s. I wasn't scared there. Like, I did really well. But it was just so weird. Out of all the places we went to in Rome, there was two times that literally stopped me in my tracks, like for no reason. Just all of a sudden, it's like, it's here. I don't know what it is. Were there any other locations that you felt anything at or nope, nope. just that? I mean, your general creepiness, because like I did three backstage tours mm -hmm. of some churches and two of them were Roman ruins, and I didn't get anything at all in the other one. <laughs> and I mean, those are some old places. Sure, sure. I didn't get anything. And, you know, we were everywhere in Rome. But those two places, for some reason, just I have no idea. But the St. Stan, let's call him that, um, that was just, it was just, like for the three of us, for me not to say anything to Kate, mm -hmm. she walked in. She's like, holy crap. My sister walks in and does the same thing. <clears throat> that was pretty crazy. That all three of us, the second we stepped into that room, had the same feeling. So what are the saints? And maybe I'm wrong on this. Maybe it's something else. But don't aren't saints like usually the saint of something where it's like they watch over this yeah, or that? Yeah, Saint is Saint Saint Stanislaus, mm -hmm. or whatever his name is, he's the patron saint of broken bones. Okay. <laughs> so if you have a Ransom. broken bone, if, if you're Catholic and, and this is your belief system, if you have a broken you bone, to him. you call to him. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What about the other dude, or was he not a saint? It was just the, dead people? I have no idea. No, they okay. weren't saints, although okay. it was the church of John and Paul. Okay. And they are. So, I don't know that that's the same John and Paul, but um, but supposedly they are buried there as well. Paul McCartney and John Lennon is here. And John Lennon, <laughs> yes, they're buried in those Roman ruins. So we came across two, like, but we saw some other creepy, you know, because they have a lot of creepy reliquaries where they have actual body parts of saints. Okay. And there was one Saint uh, Victoria or Victoria. She um, died in like three or four or 500. Mm -hmm. Same thing. I took a picture of it. Like they use her actual teeth. It's like life size and it's her actual teeth you see. Oh God. And it's, yeah, it's just creepy. Like I felt nothing when I'm looking at her. So the, the, her teeth are like in the, the statue that's the statue of her? Is that? Yeah. It's actually, oh. it's like her tomb. She's laying down. Oh. Yeah. And they just ripped her teeth out and said, hey, we'll use this for part of the sculpture. They say there's bones too, um, but you can't see the bones. The only thing that you really could see is are her teeth. Oh. I'll send you a picture of it. Yeah. Yeah, I took a picture of her because she was super creepy. That's, wow. Yeah. But a lot of those reliquaries have 
you know, there's actual, you know, that could be John the Baptist femur. Yeah. You know, I think that one's in St. Peter's. That's a biggie. Yeah. That's a big one. Well, <laughs> but it's go. really, in, that whole thing just fascinates me. I had so no I idea. Know, that they... I don't know if that was St. Stan himself, like, didn't really want us there that day. I don't know. I don't know. Obviously, you had some experience, so that's cool. That's a cool one. I've been looking forward to that. Thanks for sharing. If anything else uh, uh, hits you in the middle of the show, I'm like, holy shit, this happened too. Uh, you know, let uh, me know. And then I just think if I break a bone, I got a guy. You're good. You you are connected. You are connected. Right? And you're right? Good. You just got to get the candle, the little candle with this picture on it, then you're then you're completely good. Uh, 855 eight, what, Do you have his candle? Because I know you collect those sometimes. I could get one. Yeah. yeah. Dollar store somewhere. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our number at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. Let's go to our first letter of the day. To say, guys, thanks for featuring my bunk bed story on your uh, EPP episode to answer your question. Uh, yes, bunk beds that can be taken off and made into two separate beds are still haunted. For, many, for my second story of bunk beds, i got to ring the bell better. There we go. Uh, this was that kind of bed. This was years after that story it takes place in Oklahoma in my parents' house now. My auntie had passed away, and for our traditional funerals, the last three days, the last uh, day, or the, the last, uh, they last us long because it requires a shaman to attend to the spirit and uh, bring the spirit off into the afterlife, make sure they're no longer wandering the earth and help guide them through to reincarnation. Moving on, my auntie had passed, and my father wanted me there to pay my respects to her. I was helping out in the funeral home, and they had chairs set around the body. This was meant for close family members to mourn the dead before they bury them rightfully. Side note, I've never liked anything having to do with a corpse or such, but my mother had to use the restroom, and she wanted me to sit in her spot. I told my mother I wasn't too sure, but she said, It's okay. It's just your auntie. So I took the seat unwillingly, and I remember trying not to glance at the body, but a few feet away from me. I couldn't help but look at her. She was lying there on the setup that we had her on. She was dressed in the traditional passing outfit with her shoes and her face so well painted and looked like she was sleeping. I felt uncomfortable to the point where I had to completely shift my body the other direction until my mother returned. I left her to sit in the far back. Later, as they wrapped her up, wrapped it up for the night and placed my auntie back in her casket, we gathered our items and left. I tried not to think so much about what I went through, but due to my photographic memory, I kept thinking about all the nights that I slept in the bottom bunk. This bedroom was very small, as it was the second living room that was converted into a split bedroom with my brothers. It had a huge window that was to my feet, and this time my side of the bed was to the wall. Anyway, it disturbed me so much that I had such a hard time sleeping. As I was getting tired and my mind finally decided to let go, I finally fell asleep. Suddenly, I was jolted awake and checked the time. It read 3.33 a.m. exactly to the dot. I was awake, but I was not tired or groggy. I wonder why this was, until I suddenly felt a static shock and was frozen. My stepsister slept with me again. This time, I cannot move. I remember frantically shifting my eyes back and forth and felt the shock go from my head to my toes. From the window, I can see the moon cast shadows of the trees and branches outside onto my wall when suddenly something else was outside. It was a slow-moving shadow that seemed to shuffle left to right and disappear out of frame. This shock was so strong, I felt my hands go numb and I closed my eyes, and I knew it was her. In these three days, the spirit is allowed to wander the earth until it passes through. I remember apologizing to her that I cannot look at her and the time because I was uncomfortable. I was very sorry. As I felt its presence leave, I got out of bed and ran into my mom's room. I told her what happened, and I knew she was aware of this, so she let me sleep with her. It was embarrassing, as I was a high schooler, and yet I was sleeping with my parents. My father told me not to show it fear and to be big-hearted about these spirits. The second day came around, my mom told me not to go anymore for fear that it might latch onto me and cause distress. The second night, it happened again. I've immediately awakened again at 3.32 uh, a.m. I had this familiar feeling. It hit me again, the static shock and I felt it walk by but did not look at the window. I was paralyzed with fear and tried to keep my anxiety at bay until I couldn't any longer and once again slept with my parents at night. My mom told me not to go to her burial on the last day. I felt terrible, although I know it was for the better of my health and well-being. 
I pray that she passed on, for she had a hard life on earth with sickness and many divorces. Ever since then, I've never slept in a bunk bed again. Luckily, I'm now living on my own with a roommate in another state and will never sleep in a bunk bed. I'm keeping my distance. I still enjoy my occasional dose of fictional horror, but that's about it. This podcast is the closest I'll get to real ghost stories and such. Thank you for listening, and I hope the best for you guys. Take care, and have a wonderful day or night. So there you go. It's one of those cases where they get their three-day window to kind of go and freak the shit out of the family. And I think that one took full advantage of it. Well, no kidding. And I'm telling you what, I would jump in to bed with my mom if that had happened. Yeah. Like, I don't care how old you are. I, I, think I would sleep with anybody. It wasn't a sleep paralysis. So you got that flowing through you. You see him in the window. And yeah, I mean, do you think it was the, the aunt that was just kind of going around doing that or when that, that is going on and that's what, what the system is if they have their three days uh is it other spirits kind of coming and going does it like open a portal is there something else it could have gotten into that wasn't so great that is just causing this this energy that to, to be seen i don't know and no one does no but i think that's certainly something to consider it's hard to know. It's, it's always weird when you have the stories of the, the loving family member that passes and then freaky stuff is happening. Not just like this is, you know, eerie or like, oh, they're visiting, but like just uncomfortable. Because it shouldn't be. That should be that reassuring feeling of like you're being wrapped in a warm blanket. Oh, yeah. that's my aunt. I loved her so much. Yeah. yeah. Not like, shit, it's my aunt. Yeah. And the electricity is going through you and there's the weird ominous light outside. That just seems like. But I suppose, too, I mean, if you're suddenly dead and you got your three days to do your thing, it's probably like working with a whole new set of tools. I mean, you can suddenly have a new drill and a great saw and, and all the equipment that could build a wonderful armoire. But if you have no idea how to use it, it could just end up being this total, you know, mangled piece of wood if you don't know how to use the tool set that you suddenly are in charge of. So I could see it just kind of getting mangled when you're on the other side at first too, because you're just suddenly using these things and powers that you have no idea how to handle and how they're going to come across uh, and on the other side. Yeah. Cause now once you scared the crap out of her, yeah, it's like, it's not going then you back. go back <laughs> and then you scare the crap out of her again. Didn't mean to do that. Didn't mean to do that. <laughs> and each time no. I'm just scared the crap out of her. It could go bad really quick when you have the best of intent. Like, yeah, so it's hard to tell, but it sounds like once the the service was over, mm -hmm. like things went away, and I don't think it's necessarily the bunk bed. Yeah, this time I don't, because it, it seems to be very much connected to a life event, but yeah. other shit, a lot of times it's like, oh, bunk bed, but it's fun when you can tie in and blame a bed <laughs> when other things are going on. It kind of kind of helps you you get through it a little bit. 855-853-4802, uh, the number. You can call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and uh, share your ghost stories with us. We would absolutely love to hear them. A lot of new listeners as we get into the new year, the way that works, you call anytime you want and you record it. you got about 14 minutes to do so. Give us your story. We may use it on a future episode. If talking is not your thing, write in. RealGhostStoriesOnline.com. Click Tell Us Your Ghost Story and send it to us that way. We would absolutely love to hear it and uh, possibly use it on a future episode of the program. Let's go to a letter. It says, I've always been super sensitive to spirits. All the women in my family are. I'm a new listener, so when this encounter happened today, my first thought after calming down, was to email you guys. I've been at a new job for about a month now. It's in a very old building that was a pharmacy beforehand, but it sat vacant for 10 years before the new business moved in. In the back room, there are dusty filing cabinets full of patient info dating back to the 50s. Until today, I seriously thought a squatter lived in the back room. I'm usually the only person in the building. First one in, last one out. I'd come into work alone and the door to the said room would be open. And the lights would be on when I know full well that I'd shut the door and turn them off before locking up the night before. I also never truly felt alone in the back room and tried to make my time spent there limited. There's a historical society in the town that dropped in today. We got to talking. Turns out in 1900, a mile away from where I work, there was a train crash. It's called the Camp Creek Crash. The train's engineer had started beforehand due to the heavy rain. 
We'll be eating breakfast in Atlanta or hell, he said. The rain, which had been pouring down for two weeks, had made the river rise and, are, uh, and washed away the bridge supports in areas that they were unaware of. As the train crossed the bridge, it collapsed. The train caught fire as it plummeted into the river. 39 of the 49 passengers died. They dragged the bodies into ta the town square where I work for their families to try and identify them and collect them. Most of the bodies were charred beyond recognition, and 12 were left unclaimed and unidentified. As they were telling me the story, chills shot up and down my body, and I felt something squeeze my hand. Once they left, a wave of sadness crashed over me. I felt so alone and forgotten. Tears prickled, pricked my eyes. No one else was inside except for me. So I called out to it. I told them that they were okay. Some people remember and know what happened to them, even if we don't know their names. My knuckles felt squeezed together once again. I felt the cold on my hands the rest of the day. I don't know if I'll feel them again, but I didn't feel scared. Although the thought of a squatter didn't exactly scare me either. So maybe I'm just crazy. There you go. Train crash. Bodies in the building where you work. And it seems like there was almost a little bit of peace being made with the hands being squeezed like, thank you, you're recognizing us. That's kind of what I was getting out of it. Yeah, because it didn't seem scary. No. It wasn't like she turned around and, ah! No. But then, I don't know, do you think like in something like that happens and there is a sense of peace about it? As tragic as it was. You know, I, I wonder, especially that, if, if you're a ghost and you're stuck there for so long. That maybe they, it's just, they've kind of accepted it? Yeah. Or something? I, I wonder if it's, just, it's a recognition thing, you know, where you, you know, at the time, I'm sure, big news, lots of people talking about it, but then time passes, generations go by, and if you're still stuck there as the ghost for whatever reason, you, you may start to feel forgotten. Like look, this is a pretty big deal. This was a big accident. This was a tragedy. And when nobody's been in the building for 10 yeah. years. Yeah. It, it, maybe it's just that it's just, Oh, you're here. You're recognizing this as more than just your office space. You've, you've recognized what this building was for many of the, these victims. Thank you. You know, I, I could just see that, you know, almost like, if you're like in a you know, talking, the only thing I can think of is like talking to an, an older person where you're you're sharing a story or they're sharing a story with you and you're intently listening to it and asking questions and they're able to get it out and they just kind of reach their hand out and just, you know, thank you for listening. Thank you for taking the time and not just telling me your line of stream of consciousness bullshit. Here, listen to me. I have something to share with you. And, and they're just grateful for it. That's kind of what I'm, I'm picturing. Do you think, too, that there is possibly, um, you know, just in that what you were just talking about, too, like an older person with a story mm -hmm. that nobody stops to pay attention to hear. Yeah. There's people passing, but nobody really cares to listen. Well, in that situation, like it takes somebody a little sensitive to even pick up on them. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's that. Yeah. That nobody has noticed them. I think that's what it Jeez. is. It's it's they're noticed and they're appreciating it. What a horrible kind way to die. A cool story. It, <laughs> like, I don't know that I'd want to go back to work there, but it's an yeah, awesome story. It is. Just the imagery, though, is just horrific. Just this old hey. train and flying off the cliff in flames. Jeez. Yeah. I think it'd be like playing but, one of the worst Yeah, because you go. think the reaction would be like absolute terror. Like you encountered something and because they're dying and it's horrible and mm -hmm. it's scary. And that's the moment you would walk into. But she didn't. It was more of a peaceful thing. I wonder if they ever recovered the train out of the levee that it went into or if it's like still down there rusting away and, you know. Because something, you know, stuff like that happens, you know, especially back then, where there really isn't a way to get those things out of there. They just kind of sit as these relics. That to me is fascinating. The idea of getting down to it today and seeing what it looks like if it's still there would be very, you know, interesting. 
that's where you run into that. Oh my God, help yeah. me. Yeah. The, um, I, I recently saw on, uh, on YouTube, uh, the, the, the train from, oh, what was it? It was a, uh, was it the fugitive where the, uh, the train crashes? Um, who's in the fugitive? Um, Kevin, not Kevin Costner, uh, Indiana Jones. He visits Wichita all the time. Uh, Harrison. Harrison Ford. Yeah, the uh, I think it was the fugitive. Uh, the the train crash scene. Do you know what, you know what I'm talking about? I have never seen that. It, there's a big old train crash scene. It's back when they actually you know they did special effects in movies and they had to really use stuff. It wasn't all just computer generated. Um, they they derailed this whole train. And it still sits in the same spot where it was derailed for the movie. And sometimes people go to this spot and just find the train and they kind of take pictures by it and all that. It's become almost a tourist attraction, but you have to know where to find it because it's off a rail track in the middle of a field somewhere. Um, it, just little relics like that are always interesting to me. Over the, and, uh, go ahead. And I like way back when, like you were saying, if, how would you... Like, yeah. just lift the train back out. You, you don't. I, I, so you know part of it's still down there. You'd think so. I heard a story, or I saw a um, a post on Facebook. Maybe you saw it, too, over the weekend um, from a former upper, upper boss of ours within the, the company that you that used to own where you work and where I worked. Um, he's doing some road trips around the country right now. And he took some pictures of an area where it was like a big swampland. And he took pictures of an old train bridge. And he put a story on there of how, almost like this, a locomotive going over at one point, uh, derailed, went into this swamp, and it has quicksand in it, literally just went into the quicksand and has never been recovered. It's still down there, however far. God, how crazy is that? It sinks into the muck. And it really makes me wonder about something like that is how... You know, how in, intact is it? Because sometimes things like that really keep things preserved. I mean, if you were ever, ever able to get it out of that, which, you know, good luck. But you get you wonder, there's this whole train that just tipped over and it wasn't that tall of a bridge. So it probably didn't go down in flames. And it probably is just sitting down there in the mud, you know, with the, the skeletons of the, uh, the crew in it. Uh, That's so, creepy. Yeah, it is. It, yeah, creepy stuff. <laughs> anyway, uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. When I was little, I had two obsessions, Titanic and trains. And I, I didn't have any specific train accidents, but I always just, something about giant, you know, machinery, or if you will, really, I don't know, it, it, it enthralled me. And I could tell you every fact about Titanic in like second or third grade. Um, I don't know why. I think it's just the Asperger's in me that was doing that. But there you go. <laughs> <It could laughs> be. I don't mean to laugh at your I, Asperger's, I, but it could be. I completely believe it. I'm just J thinking of little Tony. Yeah. And I would find that very endearing oh, about God. you. Like, <laughs> yeah. I look at that. I'm like, oh, my God. Jen, for Christmas this year, got me the National Geographic, the original copy of uh, the, when they found the Titanic um, with Robert Ballard in it. Um, oh my from God, 19, what a great yeah, gift. From 82, and it, it's it's the with the cover, and it's like you can, it's an overlook of the bow of the ship. And I remember paging through that thing endlessly as a kid at my grandparents' house. And I, she, I open it up, it's like, oh my God, this is, it's an unopened, brand new copy from 82. It wasn't like a reprint. Um, <laughs> it's like, oh my God, this is amazing. So, anyway, 855-853-4802, uh, our number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Let's go to a caller. Hi. Hello, my name is Stephen, and I'm originally from Indiana, Indiana, South Bend, Indiana. And my story takes place back in 2002. Back in 2002, I made my first journey across the world to live in South Korea. The reason for coming to South Korea was to teach English. I moved to a city called Suwon. It's a mid-sized town about half hour from Seoul. And I taught at a small English academy that was somewhat out in the countryside. You could see the cows eating their, their grass right outside the window of the school. My flat, the apartment that I stayed in, was about a 25 minute walk from the academy. And as I remember, I got used to the flat. It was a one bathroom, one bedroom, one kitchen, simple 
flat for one person. And I felt pretty comfortable in this place. I always felt like I was at home. Now, one night, I clearly remember this as if it happened yesterday. I've been, this has been my fourth or fifth week in Korea. And I remember one night I'm laying down and I'm sleeping. And I remember what felt like I was having a dream. I felt like I was having this dream where I was in my room laying down. And in the dream, I look up into the corner of the room and I see these two black shadowy figures standing in the corner of the room. And as this is happening, I'm thinking, this is a dream. This has got to be a dream. And I remember as I look up in the corner of the room, look up to the left corner of the room, I see what looks like two figures. One is a taller, dark figure. And the, one, the other one is a shorter, dark figure. And to me, it felt like the taller figure was that of a man, had a man's presence. And the shorter figure was that of a woman. And I remember this very distinct reddish glow coming out from underneath them, which was one of the ways it helped me to be able to see the figures in the first place and then the dark. And as I remember, I was looking over to the corner of the room and I could hear this deep man's voice speaking in my direction. It sounded like that of a disc jockey or some kind of a radio announcer's voice, but it was all in Korean and by this time, I couldn't speak Korean. I was just learning. And so as I set up, I look over in the corner of the room and I say to the figures, my name is Stephen. I am sorry. And I lay back down. And then suddenly, I become fully awake, fully aware, and I raise back up in my bed, look around the room, look over to the corner of the room, and of course, there's nothing there. I didn't feel creeped out or anything by this. I didn't feel like I was being watched, and I never felt like I was being watched before or after this experience. So I just wrote it off to be a dream, nothing more, right? It's just a dream, no big deal. Well, come seven months later, I had my girlfriend over with me in the same apartment, and we we're talking on the bed, just talking. It was late, the lights were dark, it was, the lights were out, and as we're talking, my girlfriend suddenly glances over my shoulder and she's following something, something catches her eyes and as if something is moving along the wall. And she says to herself out loud, oh, shit. So I'm thinking, what? What's going on? So I turn around, look over my shoulder. I see nothing. My girlfriend, she says, she saw a small what looked like a small figure of a shadow, kind of hunched over, walking along the wall and disappeared into the wall. And so I'm thinking, okay. I never mentioned to her that dream experience I had because I never, I never thought there'd be a reason to share that experience. So as I, I look over to the wall, I look at her and Later, I do tell her about the dream I had. And this whole experience confirmed to me that my place was, in fact, haunted. But one thing I can say is I never felt any presence, never felt anything. I just was completely unaware, wasn't sensitive to anything. So that must tell you about my level of awareness or my level of sensitivity to the supernatural and paranormal. So with that, I have one more story for you. This one takes place in 1995. This is right after I had graduated from high school. Notre Dame University. I was with a friend. We were walking in this old building called Washington Hall. It was late at night. It was about 9 o'clock. So, well, not really late, but late enough. So... As I and my friend walk through Washington Hall, Washington Hall has a big stage in it. It's known as an auditorium. And I remember I looked up at a poster on the wall, and there was a poster of the play Macbeth. So I looked up to my friend, and 
out loud and said, hey, there's a play, Macbeth here. <laughs> I know, not, not, not a good idea according to the legend and lore of Macbeth. You're never supposed to mention its name anywhere near a stage, right? Of course, I'm, I didn't take any of that seriously. I'm not a superstitious person by any stretch of the imagination. So we're walking in the back corridors behind the stage. And as we're walking, my friend moves further ahead of me. And I just, for some reason, thought, I'll just catch up to him. So I just kind of jog up behind him. And I jokingly say to my friend, hey, is there anything behind me? He turns around. Suddenly, he jumps and his, his face literally turns white out of fear of what he saw. Again, something behind my shoulder. And he just says to me, come on, let's get out of here. Run. So we run down the stairs, get outside. He's really frantic, really wanting to get away from Washington Hall. So I ask him, well, what happened? What, what did you see? And he said, what he saw was a little black figure following me from behind. And he said it looked like kind of like a, a black figure, but it was like a person was wearing like a black leather jacket. And he said that it happened so fast he could see it like in a split second. It's like if you blinked, you'd missed it. it. He said it almost looked up at him as if it acknowledged that he saw it and then quickly darted back behind the corner in a split second. He said it just freaked him out so much that he just didn't know how to react. Of course, I wasn't sure what to believe at the time. But legend has it there is a ghost or spirit that inhabits Washington Hall. And once in a while it would come up, and there are reasons behind that. One of the reasons is back years ago there was a man, a student named Gipper, and that's a legend that he had passed out with a hangover on the steps and caught pneumonia and had passed away in the hospital. And then perhaps it's him, that ghost of Gipper, who haunts Washington Hall. And, of course, there are priests at the university because it's a Catholic university, and one of the priests insisted that the ghost at Washington Hall was a friendly ghost. Well, perhaps the ghost that my friend and I encountered, well, my friend rather, perhaps that was a friendly ghost getting ready to do a prank on us. Well, that's, those are my two stories for now, and I enjoyed sharing it, and I am an EPP on your show, and I look forward to listening to more of your wonderful episodes. So with that, I want to say, have a good day. Thanks for sharing your story, Carol. Thoughts? Well, when he was telling the first story, I was thinking about that. I'm like, so if you're in Korea or someplace where you don't speak the language and you see a ghost, mm -hmm. can you still communicate? Like, you would communicate, I guess, at a different level. Mm -hmm. But then they said something he didn't understand. So I would think that if you see a spirit, you would know what mm -hmm. they're communicating. I don't know. I had never thought of that until that moment. It makes you wonder sometimes if when something like that is, is communicating back and forth, if it's, I don't want to use the word telepathically, but, you know, almost of just the way I describe it is like downloading and uploading information. You know, where it's yeah. just like you just you get the information. Sometimes when people say, you know, I, the the ghost was even if you are talking to someone or, or communicating with someone who speaks the same language, but no words are being said, you're just getting the message. And I think something like that probably doesn't know bounds of language. It's just it's there. It's the message and it's communicated. However, that's done. I think pets, I think animals do that quite often. Oh, yeah. Agreed. But I think there had to have been something at, <coughs> excuse me, sure. something at that first house in South Korea yeah. since he had seen it and the girlfriend had seen it. But it's interesting that it wasn't more of a recurring event than that. So maybe he was living in a place like I live. It's really not haunted. That's not haunted? <laughs> but once in a while you pick up on something. It's like saying, it's like, well, you know, I don't live in an air, if like you live in an airport, but they don't live in an airport. I mean, planes just stop by every now and then, you know, they, yeah. they don't like down again. They don't like have a permanent spot here. They just kind of come and go. But, you know, it's like, that's your well, house. Once in a while you get an airplane. <laughs>
<laughs> you're just like you're like a, a small rural it's not commuter like airport. Constant airplanes. <laughs> you're not O'Hare, but you're just like some rural airport where they just kind of might come in every now and then. Uh, but you do have a runway. <laughs> it's kind of how it is. And then the second one, like, but it sounded like he didn't necessarily pick up on the second one. The mm. friend had seen it. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting, very interesting. Yeah, thanks for like sharing. Like they're obviously around him. Yeah. They're around, and uh, uh, I wonder. I wonder if there's more stories there that have occurred in uh, in that gentleman's life. Would love to uh, to hear those uh, if he has them. Over the uh, the holidays, uh, on Christmas Day, actually, I went for a hike uh, over to uh, this this town we have called Garber. Uh, which is the ghost town in the middle of the woods that no one knows quite exactly where it is, except for a handful of us. Uh, and the maps put it in the wrong spot, which I'm happy about. Um, and it's it, it was just kind of peaceful. It was a nice warm, it was about 60 degrees that day. Just took a walk over there and I took my parents over to see it. And I, I really wish I had brought in a wreath because I, I, Jen even texted me as I was walking over. She's like, you should have brought a wreath. And I was saying, I was just thinking the exact same thing. Just to just hang on the door of the old post office that still stands out in the middle of the woods. Although the door is gone, so I have to find something else to put it on. But um, it was just, it was one of those weird, I, I didn't feel anything super, you know, creepy or, or, or really much of anything. It was just more my mind just thinking, you know, years ago, Christmas Day, this is where people would have spent it. They they had, hey. this was their life. This was a special day for them, too. You know, it was, because it's around from about the late 1800s to about 1950 is when the town officially disbanded. Uh, so there was a good 60-year span that this was an active community. And we're just walking around looking at, you know, the remnants of it. And, you know, you, you, every once in a while you come across, you know, like we found a little, uh, uh, a juice glass, just you know, an old, you know, old timey glass, just you know, laying out in the the leaves. My dad had found uh, a ring from I don't know, like a horse bridle um, that was just sitting in the mud, and you find little pieces here and there that you know were not just from people that were coming out there to to camp out and check it out, you know, later in in life. Um, it was these are pieces from that town, and there's all these foundations that are around, and trees are growing through them, so it's really kind of hard to get to a lot of it. Um, but it was just an interesting, you know, feeling on Christmas Day to be in this town where, where people had once lived their lives. You should do some tours of that sometime. <laughs> it's it's not a public space. <laughs> no one, exactly. Yeah. That's why they have to meet you. And then you give them a guided tour. And it's a little <laughs> hike. It's like an excursion there in Branson. I don't think that's legal <laughs> to do that on someone else's property. I think it's it's technically owned by the bank right now. I think it went into foreclosure. Um, but there's there's no sign. Oh, please. Yeah. Don't let that stop you. <laughs> don't let legality stop legality, you. Legality. <laughs> whatever. Like, why is there a pack? of a hundred people wandering out to the woods <laughs> like in private land uh no reason whatsoever no reason. i didn't charge him anything i really didn't <laughs> but uh yeah it was uh it was neat because there's it's fun there's a little road that leads to it that's still there like you just you're just walking through fields and all of a sudden oh look a road and it's an old brick road that's all grown over and it just it kind of ends because one of it part of it really got just grown over but then this part that goes to it is really a clear path still to this day uh, i found an arrowhead on it once uh the first time we went and jen said i could not keep it because she didn't want well, me to i was going to ask you that like <laughs> yeah. with a juice glass is that something that you would keep i don't think i could i wouldn't no i i feel like i have a lot of respect for that town and there is a ghost story to it there's a there's a ghost story and i don't know all, all the details but the long and short of it is that there's a woman who I believe used to run the post office that supposedly people see out there every now and then. Um, I take it for what it's worth. It could just be an urban legend. There's not a ton of accounts with it. Um, but you do get a feeling out there like you're not alone. And you truly are, other than probably animals. <laughs> but uh, And a wild boar or two, which is what I'm more concerned with than the ghosts. Um, but... It's uh, it's just an interesting. It's it's a peaceful place, and I'm I'm kind of protective of it, and I don't want to take anything from it. I don't want to, you know, commercialize it. I just I like telling my stories of it because I think it's kind of neat 
being able to share the story of a town that time forgot. You know, almost like sharing the story of that train crash that we had earlier, like where she was yeah. recognizing it. That's kind of how I feel about that town. Maybe I'll get my hand, you know, squeezed next time I'm out there. But it's uh, it's just it's a neat little place. And if, if I ever had, you know, won the lottery or something, I would probably try and buy that plot of land just to keep that town from, I don't know if, it'll, if there ever will be expansion enough to hit that town suppose anything's possible we're not too far from it as it is but it would it would take quite a while i think it'd be pretty old by the time that happened i just don't want to see anything happen to it so there you go i'll buy it it'll open a little gift shop and i'll sell keychains rabbit's feet and spoons <laughs> <laughs> but not like in the town no like no, it has no. to be like out, out of the city <laughs> and half price tickets <laughs> It's like everything exactly. is here in Branson. So there you go. That's going to wrap up the uh, the program for today. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for being an EPP. If uh, you are one, if not, sign up to become one. Go to ghostpodcast.com. It's only five bucks a month. You can sign up for the full year. Claim yourself a spirit flask or a bunk bed bill. Ghostpodcast.com. Check it out. Get all those EPP episodes, advanced episodes, e-copy of the book, and a lot more. For being an EPP, ghostpodcast.com. Until next time, for Carol Hughes and Tony Bruschi, thanks for listening to another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online.